It's slightly different than what we've been talking about, finance, but uh, it does have effect on equity. Um, we're not showing equity in the paper, but you can look at it in financial markets and feedback effects through financial markets. So if you're interested, I can uh, send you some of those data. Um, so the, really the reason why we are interested in looking at uh, uh, El Nino is because obviously climate is very important and climate uh, uh, scientists have been looking at uh, uh, quantifying cl climate changes. Uh, you know, whether it's temperature, whether it's uh, 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 storms, hurricanes, rain, etc. And uh, well, and also as economists, we've been looking at what those uh, climate changes really mean to uh, to the global economy, but also to um, uh, each individual country. So, really, what we what we're trying to do here is add to the climate uh, macroeconomy uh, literature. Uh, uh, but he, he, the crucial thing is usually, in, in most of the exercises we do in economics, identification is actually a key issue. And, and here, what we, are trying to, what we are trying to achieve is we're trying to use this um, uh, El Nino weather events, uh, which are basically uh, above average ocean uh, surface temperatures, uh, which happen every two to seven years. Uh, and their, their, their degree of severity varies considerably. And just to show how, uh, it, the, what the implications of these El Nino effects, these exogenous uh, El Nino effects are on the global macroeconomy. So not just looking at uh, a global uh, GDP or global uh, CPI, but looking at country-specific growth rates. Uh, country specific inflation rates and then also obviously we believe that it has some impacts on commodity markets so in particular fuel prices oil prices uh, uh, food prices uh, uh, and so on so uh, really um, uh, motivation here is look at the Im impact of uh, exogenous weather phenomena uh, what is its implication for country and uh, how does that translate into uh, into commodities and commodities into countries and uh, I will show you how our model is basically linking financial real and uh, commodity markets uh, it's also there, there's a lot of research on the El Nino in many different fields and uh, lots of historians and uh, geographers will disagree but the, 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 there, there is this phenomena that we observe and economists been looking into it as well that the El Nino not only has an uh, economic effect but also has a political effect so in terms of civil conflict but uh, we're going to leave all of that out of the equation here we will just focus um, uh, on the macro side so if you don't know this is the picture of the climate <laughs> in a normal year uh, that is not an El Nino year and so what we observe is basically Asia Pacific gets uh, uh, gets a nice uh, amount of rain and on the Latin American side on the Peru side we actually have cold night the thermocline is, is uh, up basically means that we get nice cold and um, uh, nutrient rich water is good for fisheries uh, industries and so on but this picture changes quite drastically when you move to an El Nino year so uh, what happens in El Nino year you, you notice that the low pressure in Asia Pacific and the high pressure in, 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 in the Latin America basically becomes weak high pressure in Latin America and a weak high pressure in Asia Pacific. What that means basically uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, Australia, New Zealand and so on, uh, we, have, we get a drier weather. Uh, which is uh, which is usually bad because th that's when the weather is dry there anyways. So um, and also what it does is moves the thermocline down. So the the cold uh, nutrient rich water which hits Latin America is basically uh, uh, gone. So uh, it it is a quite a drastic change and the southern oscillation also has implications for other climates. Uh, 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 it's not just the, 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 the uh, Asia Pacific. So I, here is a global map, sorry you can't see very well, but the point we're trying to make here is that lots of things happen in, in Latin America, in uh, Asia Pacific, L not so much if you look at uh, Africa, so s South Africa, right, but if you move up North Africa, not, nothing really goes on in the Middle East, n no matter season, and nothing really happens to Europe, which is not surprising because the weather effect takes effect in the Pacific. So um, if, if we were just to do a country-specific, uh, I go back to this, country, I like that, country-specific uh, 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 you know, zoom into each of these individual countries, you would say, why would the Eurozone 
what would this matter to the Eurozone? But in fact, if you think of the uh, world as you know, linked globally uh, through finance, through commodities and through uh, trade, uh, well, there might be some spillovers to Europe. Now, whether they are negative or positive, this is what we're trying to uh, try, uh, find out. So, um, uh, just a quick uh, indication of what are these uh, El Nino years. So, if it's, uh, if it's defined as uh, mi if it's below minus 8, this becomes an El Nino year. So you can look, this is a, this is a pretty severe, 82, 83 was a bad, bad uh, year. And uh, 97, 98 was also a bad year. Then we've had some moderate uh, years, some uh, uh, quite recent, uh, which, which haven't been as severe as, um, uh, as uh, 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 expected. So the, we have some indication. So basically we, what we're going to do is we're going to use this exogenous variation and we're going we're gonna to map it into, uh, into the global economy. And so we're going to look at what happens in these individual countries. And so really that's our contribution. We, we're using this multi-country uh, framework and we're looking at each of these uh, individual countries. Um, uh, and we, we, we have basically 33 countries we, we, we group Euro, Europe into one, we then, you know, for robustness check, we uh, split it up, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, so uh, basically we have Europe, we have most, I mean, North American countries, Latin America, Asia Pacific, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, South Africa, and so on. So, but the important thing here is, as, as I said, we, we really are careful in modeling these international linkages. So whether it's trade, commodity markets, or finance. So, um, uh, I will tell you a little bit about the modeling. As I said, we are not the only ones looking at uh, El Nino. There have been lots of papers, but most of them look at a particular country, a particular sector, or they look at a particular commodity market. So they don't, what we're trying to do is do, do, kind of, uh, do it not at a sector level, but at an aggregate level, but looking at uh, uh, you know, a, a model of the global economy. Uh, there is a very uh, similar um, uh, kind of story uh, given by Brunner, but uh, be very careful. Brunner is basically a VAR model, uh, an aggregate of the G7 countries, and really does not find m st statistically significant results from these impulse response functions. So we are, we are not close to this uh, uh, paper, but it's trying to basically look at it at a global level, but really just aggregating uh, uh, and mostly looking at those countries which have not, nothing to do with uh, uh, El Nino. So if uh, uh, the, the G7. So um, how are we going to do that? So um, we, w this is kind of our model. Um, I don't know whether you have, uh, I, I start with this and then we can look at some equation. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to say each country is one VAR X model, VAR model with exogenous foreign variables. In each model we will put in, in each country model we will put in macro indicators. So from interest rates, short and long, uh, term to equity markets, exchange rates, uh, GDP, inflation, and so on. You can, uh, for your own, uh, I mean, if, uh, for any, you know, you can change the, if you want to change the application, you can change the variables, but we were interested in macro here. But for each country, we then also include uh, so-called star variables. These are the variables um, uh, on this. So these star variables uh, basically connect each individual country with the rest of the world, and they're basically calculated as uh, using trade weights. Again, we, you can change to use uh, trade in value weights, you can change to use just export weights, import weights, financial weights. Um, it doesn't really make much difference in our setting, but basically we're relating each country to the rest of the world by saying that it will, by looking at each country's trading partner and then uh, uh, aggregating their GDPs back into the individual country model. We also then have a separate El Nino model, which is basically this phenomena that's happening out there, which, uh, which given is exogenous. And we also have a commodity model. And to not make the model huge, we basically uh, include oil prices as a proxy for fuel prices. And then we have a non-fuel uh, commodity prices. So once, and then what we do is the nice thing about this global VAR model is that uh, the GVAR is solved for, and everything that's basically exogenous, which is all those star variables, are solved out. So when, it, when you get the model, it's a model in all endogenous variables. So now we can go and have some fun and shock any of the variables of interest and see what happens in the global economy. So um, I'm not going to go into the details, but basically each country is a, is a 4x model. X is, X's are basically domestic variables. GDP, uh, interest rate, exchange rates, equity markets, and so on. And then we have uh, connecting them to the foreign variables to the corresponding trade uh, uh, countries. And then we have this uh, 
dominant variables, a global variable, which is basically a commodity unit and our um, uh, El Nino unit. So, uh, and this, so this is why I was trying to explain. Basically, we construct each country specific variable by using a weight, and the weight comes from their trading partners and aggregates over the 33 uh, uh, countries. And it's uh, 33 there. So, um, for just for, to know for empirical applications, we need to choose some weights, and we basically use three, uh, we average over three years. All of our weights in this paper are average over three years to just avoid the you know, one year could be a particular year where you trade a lot with China or with uh, Europe, and that distorts. So, and you can and you can move these years. It does again, it doesn't make much of a difference. The results are uh, quite robust. And then we have basically a mo our model for the commodities. Uh, we allow some feedbacks, but for the model for uh, the uh, Southern Oscillation Index, we don't. So, um, that's basically our model. So. Uh, let's leave that and go to the fun stuff, which is basically the model is 33 countries. It covers 90% uh, of uh, world GDP. Uh, here, here are the listings. As you can see, we include basically, we want to include as many of those countries for which is, you know, El Nino is meaningful. So that would be the Asia and Pacific uh, region, but uh, North America, Latin America. But we also, as I said, we also include Europe and Middle East. And we, we try to include as many uh, countries as possible. Our, our restriction is basically a quarterly data. Uh, this is a model with quarterly data from 1979 Q1. So uh, going that far back, most of countries will not have uh, uh, good quarterly data. Uh, if you have some quarterly data, we, we could interpret it back. But if you have, you know, we will leave out Kuwait, which for which we have no quarterly data until the 90s. So uh, and, and and other countries. So here we are basically we think that what uh, what we will see, uh, you know, just as an effect should be really the effect should be here, we should see some here and maybe some here. Uh, here we don't know, and Europe we don't know, so that's what, uh, uh, and uh, really nobody has looked into it, so this is what uh, will be interesting. So I'm not going to spend too much time here, we have uh, six domestic variables, um, uh, a real, so we use the equity, uh, we use an equity index for each country, and I should also mention that not all countries will have obviously long-term bonds. Uh, so long-term uh, returns are not included for all countries. For most countries, they are. We include for every country, uh, GDP, exchange rate, and inflation is included. Uh, for instance, for Saudi Arabia, interest rates are not very meaningful, uh, and, and there is no really developed uh, market, uh, equity market that far back, so we exclude those variables. But again, you can, uh, you can change that and see uh, how that affects it. And then we have the foreign variables, corresponding foreign variables, where we, as I said, we average over the um, three years, the weights are averaged over three years. And uh, we obviously need to include so we have the macro variables, we then include this uh, sudden oscillation index. Um, and I mean, we, we, we shouldn't really expect that uh, US GDP should affect the El Nino or uh, Chinese GDP should affect the El Nino or equity markets should affect the El Nino. So there is no feedback effects to the El Nino, but El Nino affects everybody. So that's the kind of story of the uh, uh, El Nino. Now for commodity markets, we know that there is some evidence for commodity markets are affected. So commodity markets are affected because if we have dry weather, obviously we have, you know, maybe exports of particular uh, commodities are dropped. So basically we, uh, we want to include that. Now, the problem in this literature is mainly in the global war literature is that U.S. is used as a, a large open economy. Every other country is modeled as a small open economy. And so to explain uh, commodity markets, um, uh, I mean, I think 99% uh, of the papers will put in oil prices as a, as a measure for commodity markets in the U.S. model. The reason being U.S. You know, consumes 25% of world oil, so it drives, and some people now can argue that, well, U.S. produces you know, a large proportion of the spare capacity that we have in oil, and so basically it's very important. But the, on the other hand, we know that you know, effects uh, in Middle East, uh, in North Africa, uh, in Latin America, also has an impact on oil markets. So there is no good reason for why the U.S. should be the driver. Um, and so one of the m things we do here is we move it. Um, actually, in another paper with uh, Hashem Pesaron, we do we we do we do a similar thing. But we so we kind of borrowed it. But what we do is basically we we move commodities out and create create uh, a model for it. And so now the question is, oil prices is not a good proxy for 
no, potentially not a good pro proxy for non-fuel prices when it comes to El Nino because El Nino might impact fuel and non-fuel commodities differently. It will impact both, but it might impact them differently. So we split them up. And so our non-fuel commodities, they're, they're just a basket of commodities, their weights based on export in the world, and basically it's an index from the uh, fund. So we, we basically have oil prices and non-fuel prices are, as, our, as our commodity uh, market. So, and then to, but, but then obviously commodity markets will be impacted by US GDP and Chinese GDP. It has both demand and supply story. It might be affected by equity markets. It might be affected by interest rates and so on and so forth. So we allow basically feedback effects into the commodity market. So commodity markets can affect everybody and everybody can affect the uh, sort of commod commodity uh, markets through feedbacks. So and one way to do that now here is no longer country. What we do is we aggregate global GDP and so on using just PPP GDP weights. So again, uh, averaged over, um, sorry, that's a typo. It should be 2009 to 2011 weights. It doesn't make any difference. You change by three years. So, and obviously, as you know, uh, uh, the region, we now have two large regions, so basically the United States and we have Europe. We have aggregated the European region and uh, the other economies with, you know, except for China, Japan and so on with relatively large weights, but the other pretty small. So here is basically our model. The US model is modeled as a large open economy. So what do we have? What, what do I mean? Basically, we don't allow and we test for it. We don't allow uh, global finance to impact the United States. We allow the United States finance to affect the global economy. So basically, we don't include uh, uh, equity. We don't allow feedback effects from foreign equity markets into the US equity markets. We think it works the other way. We test for it, and it rejects that it's exogenous in the US model. But we also, and interest rates as well, we don't allow the foreign interest rates to impact the US interest rate. But we do allow the US interest rates to impact India, China, and, and uh, Europe, and so on. So that, that, this, is a, this is a different model from all the other countries. It's a open, large open economy. Every other country is modeled as a small open economy uh, where basically US and other countries can have an impact on uh, uh, both uh, interest rate markets and the bond markets and the equity markets. The commodity markets, they said, it only the endogenous variables, uh, the endogenous variables are oil and not fuel. And we do allow El Nino to impact on commodity markets as we do with all the other Variables and in the El Nino market basically is a, uh, is is uh, is just um, uh, the El Nino. So you, you're not too much interested in data, but most of the data is publicly available. If you want to go and uh, play around with this, and if you want to use it for different applications, it's 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 all publicly available. And there's now a GVAR website where you can download the quarterly data for all of these countries, so you don't have to do much. Or just plug it in. So um, uh, I don't bore you with this, but for we basically run an individual country. We choose the specification for each country individually. Then, what, having chosen the order of the var, var x star, we choose the number of co-integrating relations. And having done that, we go back and make sure that the global model is basically stable. Remember, it's 21 countries. It's a pretty, it's a pretty massive. Uh, model and we readjust. I, I think only for two countries, Korea and Saudi Arabia, and then we re, 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 uh, remodel it. And just to convince you that basically everything is okay, if we shock the world, it should all go back to zero. And it so it, it does, and it's quite quick. This, these are coaches by by most uh, half life of the shocks are most you know within two years a global shock has worked itself out. So um, here is the here is the important bit. Now we say, okay, what would happen if there was an El Nino shock? So we shock the model and say, now an El Nino occurred. What would happen to the global economy? So we can start, look, I mean, look at those countries we are very uh, uh, suspicious about. So Australia. So we look at Australia and we, not, we notice that Australia, uh, sorry, two stars and one star is just significance levels. So uh, Australia, negative, these are GDP growth rates. Uh, we, we observe that GDP falls, and it's not, quite, it's not so surprising because basically we have, we, we, we have dry weather and then it gets even more drier, so you have droughts. It really impacts wheat. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the severity of bushfires are, uh, increases, the frequency increases, and what, you do, what happens actually when El Nino year, we observe that wheat exports fall dramatically and global wheat prices go up. So basically uh, the Australian case is 
uh, is nicely uh, uh, shown here by imp in empirics. You look at New Zealand as well. New Zealand, places where, where you have basically dry, uh, it gets drier, places where there is actually, there, and some places is flooding, which, which is also bad in terms of agriculture. So basically you do get this negative impact on um, New Zealand. I should also point out that these are basically share of primary sectors. Uh, we have some very large shares in the prime, primary sectors, and they sort of correlate with the drop in the, in the GDP, obviously. So uh, Indonesia is actually a very interesting case because two things happen in, in Indonesia. So we get less rain and sort of uh, nickel exports <laughs> start dropping. And that's kind of odd. You say, what does rain have to do with nickel uh, exports? And actually, the, uh, Indonesia is the largest exporter of nickel, which is used to reinforce steel, which is quite important. So basically, nickel exports drop massively and nickel prices go up. Now, the reason for that is you use water, hydropower is used to mine this. So essentially, uh, you have two net bad effects in Indonesia. Mining sector gets hit hard and the agriculture. So you notice that coffee, if you drink a lot of coffee, coffee prices start going up, cocoa prices start going up. So basically, Indonesia is severely uh, uh, hit. If you look at other countries, so for instance, um, uh, let's, let's, look at, ah, let's look at India. Now, this is quite disappointing. India does quite well, actually, and, you, and, and, uh, and uh, we, we had this prior that basically India should be, uh, you know, affected a lot. So we looked at it, and this result is quite robust. But it, it is affected in the, in the short term. It is a negative impact. Now, um, our story is as follows, and my, uh, some colleagues actually in India have worked on this recently. I ju we just read a paper we're, we're looking at... Um, uh, First of all, it's not quite clear that a weak monsoon is correlated, is co does coincide with the El Nino. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't happen. So uh, this, is, this is might be where uh, uh, is kind of the, uh, we get the lower impact on uh, India. The other story is obviously the uh, agricultural sector in India, has, as you know, has dramatically dropped, you know. Uh, so that is one impact. And the other impact is, um, as far as I understand, uh, there has been quite a, a big shift from uh, uh, crops that are sown basically in the winter, harvested in the spring, rather than uh, in, the, in the rainy monsoon season. So that could have a massive impact. And uh, uh, my limited understanding, again, is basically what, what we also observe is that um, there has been some uh, facilitation of shifting to, you know, when... When you get an early warning system about that there is an El Nino might happen, there has been this shift from uh, the, these crops that are grown during the monsoon season to basically be uh, drought resistance and short duration. So you get the yield quite quickly. So uh, that might also have something to do with it. But also, if you look at over the year, the agricultural yields has massively increased. So even if you know El Nino was severely uh, harmed the Indian eco economy 40 years ago, uh, you know, you would expect that the impact is much smaller. So th th those, are some of the, those are some of the stories one can take. But nevertheless, we do observe that in the first quarter there is a, there is a drop in, the, uh, in, in, GDP, in GDP growth rates. Uh, some interesting countries to look at. You, you notice, you know, we, we show this to some people and they say, oh, why, does, why is it negative, you know, impacting, for instance, Chile and Japan? But this negative impact, actually, as we move on, becomes positive. That's quite puzzling. And um, it, it sort of is, but sort of isn't. Because, for instance, if you look at Japan, what happens is that you get, uh, you know, tornadic and uh, you, you get a lot of destruction, okay? And uh, so uh, some people can argue, but you're not measuring wealth. You may, but let's go with it. If we look at GDP, so what happens is basically you have destruction. And then what happens eventually is that the construction sector picks up massively. So once the construction sector is picking up, you obviously start seeing that in, the, uh, in, in, in GDP. So that's basically one of the stories. For Chile, again, rain is quite bad. It gets very rainy. So the agricultural sector does well. But if you remember, Chile is a big, big copper producer. What, is, what rain does is means access to mining is, is reduced. So basically, uh, copper exports start dropping. But eventually, it becomes positive. So here is the other link. So you observe that some countries, which shouldn't have an impact, suddenly in the third and fourth quarter become positive. The reason for that is basically spillover effects. So once uh, you, you, so you know, imagine that it hit your country, but then another country like the United States actually benefited from the El, El Nino. Uh, 
if the U.S. starts benefiting from El Nino, U.S. is trading obviously with other economies, and you know those economies, because of the trade channels, start picking up. So let me give you an example. So uh, U.S. If you look at U.S. is positive. This is it looks massive in the fourth quarter, 0.55 percent, but it's actually not far from what uh, some colleagues have estimated from the 97-98 El Nino. The, 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 the in, in, in dollar terms, it was 15 billion net. So it was a cost-benefit analysis on the El Nino. It was about 15 billion uh, 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 benefit, which translated to 0.2% of GDP then. So basically, uh, and that was direct contribution of the El Nino. The indirect effect comes when you start then trading. So for instance, with China. So El Nino year, what should happen to China, we don't really know because uh, north gets uh, uh, dry, south gets rainy, and we don't really observe much, you know, st from stylized facts. So, but actually, China starts picking up, and China starts picking up because U.S. is picking up. So, basically, there's a lot of a lot of uh, interactions going on here, which um, uh, uh, which which we we see. Singapore as well. Sing Singapore is very large. It's one percent. It almost it scares me when things become great and I won. But basically, uh, it's, also, it's also a demand story because once the global economy start picking up, there is obviously... Um, so Singapore is big on shipping. So, and once global economy starts picking up, so for instance, dem fuel demand, demand for goods, uh, this starts picking up and the, that translates into the Singaporean uh, GDP. So uh, just a few, I just want to show a few... Um, uh, effect for Brazil again. This is also an interesting country because in Brazil and north it gets very dry. In south it becomes quite wet. South agricultural yields go up. North there is very little coffee and and, and soybeans, but that compensates for um, uh, from in the south. So uh, the net effect seems to be um, pretty much zero. And then it starts picking up. It becomes positive again. If you if you think about their trade with uh, China, uh, U.S is about uh, 50, uh, 50 I think almost 50, and Europe is about 57 percent. So um, uh, that's basically the story. So uh, overall, what we observe is that if you have, uh, um, the larger the geographical area you have, obviously, the less negative impact you get from the El Nino because, you, you know, because of the weather, you, you kind of diversify it. But also, you know, the lower your agricultural sector, your primary sector is in GDP, because if it impacts you, it has a lower uh, uh, negative effect. So um, basically, that's uh, one of the stories that we go with. I also want to show you commodity because I'm interested in commodities. So commodity markets, uh, it's slightly so what happens to oil prices? Oil prices start going up and oil prices keep going up. Now, uh, it also worries me when pr prices keep going up, but there's a nice story to it because initially what happens is you get less rain. And if you get less rain, then, you know, for instance, in Indonesia, you start getting these big tankers, these big ships in to, for instance, uh, uh, to, you know, create electricity by natural gas or what, whatever, uh, oil and so on. So basically fuel prices start picking up initially because there's a low supply of all other types of energy. So that is consistent with the story here. But then it keeps going up. And the reason for that is if you look at the global economy, the global economy overall seems to go into a uh, 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 boom in a sense. You know, and, and the boom is very severe, but it, it does better. So basically what happens is then you demand more fuel, you know, so in, in terms of production. So that's the basic story from oil prices. What was initially a supply effect, so you demand oil because you, you, know, you don't have access to other sorts of energy that you usually have. You suddenly start demanding more oil because now you're doing much better. Um, I should also mention that the oil sector in general gets healthier because there is less negative supply shocks, which kind of uh, uh, reduce. Because in, uh, in an El Nino year, you get less hurricanes in, in the east. Uh, uh, so, for instance, Mexico in the Mexican Gulf, which is good for the oil industry, obviously. So the, few, and the non non fuel commodity prices is, is is essentially because, f first of all, this is an index of 38, so I, I'm not I'm not too worried that we don't see a significance in the very few first quarters. But it starts picking up and become positive because obviously ni you now have nickel exports dropping, wheat exports dropping, coffee, soybean, fish meal, and so on. So when this starts, uh, when the exp when the, the supply side here, prices start going up. But then in the fourth quarter, the this kind of stories again, like oil, you have a basically an AD shock. Base, so you start demanding more, uh, 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 more of these uh, um, uh, items. Uh, so inflation. I just want to show we, we generally have inflation pressures. I won't go into it. Uh, and uh, 
uh, in, for, in, for instance, for in, we look at India, actually, we have quite a large inflationary uh, pressures. The story, uh, 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 I mean, and also if you look at Indonesia, those countries which, I mean, uh, uh, you, you notice for the US, for instance, like you're, it's quite small, US, uh, Europe, uh, we have in, in inflationary pressures, and yeah. So basically, uh, we do have, and again, this this would be in line with an uh, aggregate demand. Uh, uh, well, first of all, it's, for those countries, is food. I mean, when food prices start going up, and food is a large part of your uh, basket, then obviously your inflation start picking up. But I think for the U.S. and and Europe, basically, the story is that we do have an uh, aggregate demand side pressures. So we map basically our impulse responses to the weights used in the CPI food weights in the CPI basket as, and you know as expected you notice that the higher the weights are the larger the uh, uh, impulse responses are from the uh, inflationary projects.